Hey everyone, welcome back to our speaker series here in post-communist transition. And today in our studios, I am pleased to introduce a good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Mladen Murdail of uh, Webster University, who's currently teaching there at uh, in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Uh, I met Mladen a number of years ago at the uh, Annual Association for the Study of Nationalities Conference, which is held um, every April or May at uh, Columbia University, and uh, he and I have uh, worked on a number of projects together. Uh, most recently, uh, he was a contributor uh, to a uh, journal series that I was an editor for on parastates, and um, he sort of led the discussion on the roots of ethnic conflict and uh, historical grievances between Serbs and Albanians in Kosovo, and we are pleased uh, to have him here for the first time um, as our guest speaker for Southeastern Europe. So, Mladen Murdal, for the hour, welcome once again. Thank you, Mike. Great to be here. So, I had mentioned um, in the introduction of this class that uh, a number of countries within the uh, post-communist world have been um, experiencing a noted decline in the quality of democracy, at least as far as uh, the data given by Freedom House. So you can take that however way that you want. But I think two of the most noted um, and surprising cases was that both this year and last, both Hungary and Serbia um, were downgraded from free to partly free states. And while I think it's safe to say that neither country is in danger of falling into um, you know, the, the type of authoritarian models that many of us know in political science, what do you think explains, um, at least as far as Serbia, sort of the, you know, the rise in um, illiberal uh, democratic characteristics among many of uh, Serbia's political actors? Well, uh, usually it is a combination of factors. Uh, what comes to my mind is um, some sense of fatigue among the population, because what we got from uh, the 1990s, uh, the transition from communism to something else, uh, was uh, a series of civil wars, uh, NATO intervention. Uh, then we had a very brutal fight between the government and the opposition that ultimately in 2000 led to the uh, violent yet not bloody uh, overthrow of the of the uh, president at the time, who who uh, wasn't quite a dictator but wasn't far from that. And after that, we expected that the West West was going to embrace us, uh, and it did in in uh, in a certain way. But the the majority, the the, the democratic majority, soon uh, split into different factions, which then started fighting each other. So then we had a couple of uh, uh, unfortunate uh, um, situations, like a murder of the prime minister, uh, and then the destabilization within this pro-democratic uh, 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 group of parties uh, um, around the issue of Kosovo. And then we had another sort of uh, um, cycle of uh, uh, previously authoritarian socialist party getting into, into a coalition with the Democratic Party it fought against during the 1990s. And people were getting tired because what people were able to see was that um, the, the government's parliamentary majorities changed, but the corruption and, and nepotism and the uh, um, so-called partocracy uh, remains. So ultimately, um, the only party that did not uh, uh, win power for itself, that did not exercise power was uh, the reform or, or you know, cloaked uh, in reform, the, the radical party from the 1990s, who uh, sort of tried to whitewash uh, its past sins and renamed itself to the progressive party. And in 2012, uh, they managed to get to power. Now, these guys are brutal thugs who are using government resources uh, to enrich themselves in uh, such a way that is uh, never seen before. Uh, it's hardly, it's very hard to see where the organized crime stops and the, and the political party organization starts. So what we have now is a combination of several things. Um, uh, people tired uh, because of the previous cycles where, where, where people were actually fighting to remove the party in power and put the opposition in power because they were not happy with, with, the, with the ruling party. And now there's nobody else left to put in power uh, who already did not exercise uh, power. So there is, a, there is this fatigue. Why should I risk uh, getting into conflict with a mm, pretty uh, authoritarian and brutal party uh, in order to get something similar after the next elections? 
So, so the, on, on the part of a wider population, the tactics is join them because you can't beat them. And even if you can beat them, it's not going to change much. So that, that's one, one end. That's what, what, what I would, uh, uh, um, how I would explain uh, what's happening, this, this, uh, um, this fatigue uh, to, to, to fight for, for democracy among the, among the population. On the, on the side of the, of the government, what we see is a brutal takeover of government funds, government resources, and draining them uh, into private, private uh, companies, uh, all sorts of, of, of criminal activities are, are going on. And all that is very, very carefully uh, hidden from the critical group uh, uh, of voters who uh, just watch government-controlled media. And these government-controlled media, some of them are owned by the government, some of them are not. But they are afraid of the government. So what we have is uh, some sort of uh, weaponization of capitalism so that uh, government can say, hey, we did not kick out this journalist from the, from the television. It's uh, private television. Government has no intervention there. We cannot do anything. It was a decision of the, of the owners of this private television uh, not to work anymore with this journalist. With, well, we all, all know that they did it because they're afraid of the government. And to wrap the whole thing up is the international context in which the current government is, has been for many years making concessions on the problem of Kosovo. Uh, so uh, what the government in Belgrade did was to dismantle some of the uh, informal uh, um, um, instruments of influence in what is a breakaway secessionist province of Kosovo. And uh, in exchange for that, uh, it got some sort of um, you know, flexibility, so to say, or toleration on the part of the EU and the US when it comes to undermining democracy. So when you have this you know, political calculations, uh, very big influence of government in the economy, uh, tired people who don't want to fight anymore, and international context that, that uh, uh, is uh, uh, permissive of this democratic backsliding, uh, then you have what you have in Serbia. We are not listed anymore as a free country. And, and even when we were listed as a free country, uh, the situation was far from ideal, and I, I remember that uh, quite vividly. Uh, so that, that's actually why these guys are now in power. So all that put together, you have a very, very undemocratic uh, uh, set of circumstances. Well, this is a laundry list of, of, of conditions, really beginning, um, as you mentioned, um, at the start of this description, with the uh, the tragic death of uh, Zoran Jinjic. Um, we're coming up on um, almost 20 years uh, since his uh, assassination. Let me uh, just begin with Jinjic because I know that the literature oftentimes mentions and uh, my experience multiple times in Serbia uh, sort of confirms that there was this sense of optimism. There was, I think, a genuine sense of optimism among many Serbs from roughly the end of 2000 until March of 2003, when Jinjic was assassinated, that things were finally getting better. Um, and while it was going to take a long time uh, for that to happen, I think that there was a, a genuine sense of um, popularity that Jinjic had, especially with um, you know the younger generation here. And you know, his, his assassination is oftentimes um, um, compared with, I don't know if it's, um, you know, appropriate or not, but it, it is compared with the assassination of JFK um, in the United States. And, you know, it, it, if, if for nothing else, the sense of optimism just, sense, just seemed to have died or just the sense of disappointment almost came back uh, among many people that, uh, you know, nothing good uh, can really happen. Now, while it's um, sort of risky to sort of over mythologize Jinjic, especially as you know it's you know, 20 years since his murder. Um, you know, I was wondering if maybe you can speak to something about maybe that 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 feeling, if if that optimism and this sense of um, some um, progressive forward thinking was actually going to take place um, under Jinjic. Um, is this something that was an opportunity that was lost? Is this something that also just can't be replicated uh, by any other political actor? Uh, Jinjic was a man of uh, great uh, political talent and energy. Uh, however, his death made retroactively made uh, this, this, this fame of him being uh, a man on the, on the path to, to give you know, total 
uh, a reform to, to, the, to the Serbian people. I mean, to to make, to, to somehow uh, renew the country uh, into a, a full-fledged democracy. And that's really far from the truth because uh, before he was assassinated, he was not very popular in in polls. Uh, he ranked quite low. And I think one reason why the uh, assassins decided to, to they could kill him was that actually he was not very popular in the population. Um, before his death, there were very nasty uh, clashes with the uh, partner in removing Slobodan Milosevic uh, from, from, from power, uh, the party of Vojslav Kostunica. So we have Democratic Party and Democratic Party of Serbia, which was more right-leaning, more nationalistic. Um, and they they did clash uh, very very in a very nasty way uh, in the 2002 2003 um, before before he died before he was killed. So had he not been killed, uh, that clash would have would have continued and and uh, it would have um, created some uh, would have created some space for the for the socialist party and the radical party uh, to move in uh, and to and to bounce back from the from the low. Uh, popularity that they had immediately after the overthrow of Milosevic. So I think that that even if he wasn't killed, uh, Serbia would have uh, continued down the pretty much the same path. Um, um, what what I think was more crucial, more important at that time, was the fact that the country was opening to to the West, and we had some of the uh, external debt uh, um, nullified, so to say. Uh, by by London uh, uh, investors, um, uh, London club, Paris club, or, or, or others who owed some debt, uh, uh, some Serbian external debt. So uh, it made uh, this, uh, it contributed to this feeling of the of the people that we are now being embraced again by the West, that we, you know, are on the path of of, of you know recovering uh, from the 1990s, and that. Uh, the West is going to be buddies with us, especially after 2001, when there was a Albanian rebellion in the southeastern part of Serbia, of what uh, Serbs consider central Serbia, so not Kosovo. Um, after which, during which uh, NATO actually partnered with with the Serbian army and the and the Prime Minister Jinjic in order to put this re rebellion down without too much violence. So that was uh, just two years after. Uh, the the brutal NATO bombing of Serbia and for Serbs that was incredible change that actually gave a lot of lot of hope despite the resentment toward NATO uh, the idea that that uh, so so quickly after the bombing NATO and Serbia could actually partner up uh, and and uh, and uh, put down an Albanian rebellion uh, was quite quite an extraordinary event so I think external uh, circumstances contributed much more to this sign of hope. Than, than uh, uh, Prime Minister Jinjic uh, uh, himself. But, but of course, killing a prime minister, uh, regardless of who he was, even if he wasn't uh, of any great value as a politician or as a reformer, uh, must put the country back. I mean, you, you can't just have such a high, high person assassinated and, and pretend everything's, everything's, uh, everything's okay. So he, I, think, I think his death retroactively made him uh, larger than, than he really was. Do you think that that also gave some sort of extended legitimacy to his party, the Democratic Party, uh, Demokratska Stranka, which, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it seems that, the, you know, a lot of I mean, for, people tend to forget for most of the 2000s, uh, the, the Democratic Party was the party that ran Serbia. And it was um, re, it was expected to, that it was going to carry Serbia into the European Union, reconnect it to the West, um, come to some kind of... Um, uh, consensus over Kosovo. Um, the party today is in complete tatters. Um, I don't even know, um, you know, if it. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I don't even know who's leading it at this point. Uh, it's not Tadic. Yeah. I know that. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're they're not significant political actor anymore. But the brand name is their brand is there. You know, like when you say BS, BS. You know, when you say Democratic Party, everybody kind of know what you think about. You know, it's Gingis party. So Gingis should be becoming a martyr gave this party uh, more of a you know like cool vibe with, you know like they have their own you know saint so to say political saint so that's that's kind of important and that's why there were so uh, there were so many vicious fights within the party uh, for the, the the legacy of the party so when they had uh, fights uh, for the leadership uh, it was because 
DS has such a such a uh, is a, is a easily recognizable uh, a name is a brand in among Serbian voters. However, the apathy and the resignation among the voters uh, led to uh, most of the population moving to you know joining the, the progressive party either as members. I mean, progressive party that is dominating Serbia now has registered like seven hundred thousand. Uh, members in the population that's like barely over six million, which is incredible. Uh, so that just goes to say how, how these other parties are insignificant anymore because people are so tired uh, of fighting for the change uh, without actually getting any. So uh, I would say I would say Democratic Party and Democratic Party of Serbia uh, bear the responsibility for uh, neglecting or uh, you know like um, allowing uh, Socialist Party and the Radical Party to come back now uh, in bed with the, with the West because of all the concessions that they made uh, regarding Kosovo. And I don't really see uh, uh, in foreseeable future how that's going to change. It makes me really, really worried. But do you agree with um, some of the uh, sort of off the cuff um, comments from Western media that, um, you know, the, 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 um, the victory for the Serbian progressives, um, the comeback of the Socialist Party of uh, Serbia. I mean, is this really a return of hypernationalism? Is this a return to the Milosevic era? I know that the, a lot of these things are just clickbait for, uh, you know, Western readers here. But I don't think that that's a fair assessment. I mean, the, the Serbian Progressive Party certainly has its roots within uh, the more, you know, hyper-nationalistic Serbian radical party. Um, but they're pragmatic. They seem to be pragmatic, um, if only for, um, you know, opportunistic reasons. Um, and it seems that a party that was really a splinter of a far more radical nationalistic party has really, in the words of, you know, some um, commentators like, you know, Florian Bieber, um, achieved state capture. Um, what, you know, you think, um, uh, you know, what, what explains that? I mean, how do, you know, how, how do we explain, let's say, the general apathy and resignation among many people in Serbia about politics becoming nothing but one disappointment after another, and yet the SNS just seems to be this, um, this, this um, almost unstoppable political force, almost modeling itself after uh, Orban's Fides, uh, just, uh, you know, north of the border. Yeah, but uh, Orban is, is far more to the right. Uh, what is, uh, I think, essential to understand the progressive party is that they are catch-all party, and that they have this uh, sort of political wizardry that they understand that a large segment of population will hear what they want to hear uh, from what, what progressive party leaders say. So you can have at the same time people, uh, Vucic, the, the, the leader of the progressive party, uh, welcoming uh, Gerhard Schroeder, uh, the person who was uh, uh, in charge of Germany, German foreign policy, uh, during the bombing of, of Serbia, uh, as, as a friend, as, a, as an ally. So you have uh, uh, such, a, such a crazy things happening, and his, his followers, his, his, uh, his voters, uh, you know, they, they accept that. They don't mind that. So they, they portray that as uh, his cunningness, you know, our leader is cunning, you know, we know that he doesn't like them, but this is just uh, diplomacy, which is a, a great position to be in when you are a leader, that you can make, uh, uh, you know, dramatic diplomatic moves and keep your base, you know, keep your keep your followers without, you know, punishing you. So he can talk to many people. So he's a, being a catch-all party, um, he, he, he's then, uh, it is easy then to uh, uh, um, define that party when you look from the outside, when you look from the from the West as whatever you want. If you want to call them, uh, you know, kleptocrats, yes, they are. If you want to call them nationalists, yes, they are. If you want to call them, you know, progressives, uh, I mean, yes, they are. He put, uh, uh, you know, like a lesbian prime minister in charge. I mean, uh, for God's sake, I mean, in Serbia, you have a, a lesbian prime minister and the party is not punished by the by the voters who are, you know, in general, not, not too gay friendly in Serbia. So how, how is that possible? It is possible because uh, people are tired of, of uh, fighting uh, uh, for change, and uh, they see that this uh, party uh, does not hesitate too much to use violence uh, and intimidation uh, to to uh, keep its power. So you, you have a you have a, a mix of everything. It is a true catch-all party, 
um, and they they uh, um, enforce that by using government resources and uh, clearly sending a message that they're ready to fight uh, even physically uh, to stay in power. So uh, there is no uh, uh, um, power on the horizon in the opposition or resentment in the population that can turn against them, uh, except that lately uh, we have some incidents that show that there is some sort of resistance in the population when it comes to ecological movements. So we have a great problem in some uh, sections of Serbia uh, with uh, uh, private uh, entrepreneurs um, creating small uh, hydropower plants and thus deprive the local population of water. And there was some backlash and some physical you know, confrontation. And uh, the, the latest uh, scandal is about uh, Rio Tinto, uh, the, the great uh, uh, multinational corporation exploring uh, uh, rare materials such as lithium. Uh, and now people are very much afraid that the uh, western part of Serbia is going to be polluted very much because of uh, um, uh, if, if it happens so that Rio Tinto starts uh, uh, mining lithium there. So we have here like a genuine grassroots movement uh, against that. And that, uh, you know, that gives me some hope that that can actually spark some, some more rebellion. But other than that, other than that, the situation is pretty, pretty bleak. So this, this leads to an interesting observation about Serbia, which may explain its partial freedom status, although I think that it deserves some qualified explanation here. It's mm -hmm. not that there is any rescinded um, political rights or civil liberties. It may just be that there is just simply a lack of any political alternatives, that there's a lack of any kind of opposition, where the SNS, if you, you know, if, if I read you correctly, its biggest strength, its ace in the hole, is that it has no ideology, right? The SNS does not pertain, does not hold to a particular party ideology. If it's a catch-all, and it can be something for everybody, so it can be yeah. pro-European Union, but it can also be in defense of um, Serbian national identity and values. It can claim to be pragmatic in terms of finding a lasting solution for Kosovo, um, but it will absolutely refuse to recognize Kosovo's um, independence, which we will certainly get to Kosovo uh, in, yeah. you know, in, in, in a short while here. Um, but I guess I want to focus on one more thing, at least in terms of the political thing, and then, and then we can and we can uh, jump to some other topics about Serbia and then the uh, the wider region here. Um, the strength of the SNS, in no small measure, has also much to do with the um, political acumen of its leader Alexander Vucic. Um, who really, um, f for those of us who have been following Serbian politics over the past 20 years or so, if, if someone was to go back in time and tell us in, in, in 2001 that this guy was going to be effectively the undisputed ruler of the country in 20 years, I don't think anybody would believe that. Um, you know, what can you uh, sort of uh, describe a little bit about Vucic, who is... Uh, you know he has his detractors. He has his he has his critics, but you have to admit he has found this rather neat way um, through this middle of being someone for everyone. Um, and in, again, the words of uh, Florian Bieber, um, the quintessential model of a stabilocrat, um, someone that um, is really sort of emerging as a type of political power broker in Central and Southeastern Europe. Yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind when, when I think about the uh, current president of Serbia and the leader of the Progressive Party, Aleksandar Vucic, is that uh, this is the guy who, from when he was 19, 20 years old, uh, is in politics actively. So from the 1990, 1991, he's actively in, uh, uh, in, as a member of the 1981, uh, 1982, I think, member of the Serbian Radical Party. but very active uh, at, since that time. So for 30 years, he's someone who is going around, not just Serbia, but during the war in Bosnia and even the Serb-held part of present-day Croatia, uh, someone who's talking to people. So he knows not just all the all the towns in Serbia, he knows all the villages in Serbia because he, he cruised so much around the country in the political campaign that he knows everything. Like he, his, his knowledge of, of Serbian geography is just stunning. So whenever he shows up, and this works with people, especially you know the, your your average voter, 
uh, when he starts talking uh, as if it's all spontaneous, when he starts talking about some village near some small town, near, near a big town, uh, the voters who, who see that, they see this is the guy who knows us. Like, this is the guy who's been around, who's been into our villages. He, he, he's for us. You know, he, he, I think, gets a lot of credit because uh, of the, such a simple thing as, as knowing by heart uh, all the counties, all the cities, all the towns, all the, you know, uh, uh, small, small villages, because he spent so much time campaigning around the country with, uh, with the Serbian, what was then Serbian Radical Party. So that's the one thing. Uh, his great, great political experience, his knowledge of, you know, how are the people, you know, what are the people, you know, what do they think, what do they feel? Uh, another thing is that he um, was in the media a lot. You know, he, he knows uh, how to run newspapers. He, he knows what to write, how to you know, choose words for a title. You know, he knows how to play with people's emotions. And on top of that, when he uh, uh, got to power, now he has vast resources that he can use to hire the best pollsters, the best you know, experts in doing focus groups, in doing polls, in doing all the sorts of this stuff that he can measure actually every day He's measuring how people react to what he's saying. So when when this research uh, shows that something that he said did not resonate to the people, he's going to immediately drop that and move to, move to something else. So so it's becoming very sophisticated. Uh, so much so that not just that he has the army of bots online to put some sort of uh, uh, power balance uh, uh, on on, on uh, social media, uh, but also what he's doing is that he's creating his own alternative non-governmental uh, uh, um, online presence that uh, takes like short clips from people in the opposition or independent analysts or journalists who are critical of him and they cherry pick uh, this, this uh, uh, you know, sound bite, this is uh, clips uh, from, from these people's speeches and they put it out uh, in the, on the internet as if this, this, these people were criticizing uh, the opposition uh, or uh, celebrating what the government did, even though that's not the case. But he understands that people are not going to fact check that, that most of the people are not going to do it. So we are dealing with someone who is, I think, you know, the 21st century dictator who does not care just about uh, uh, controlling the police, but also policing uh, the, the, the social networks, policing the, the ideas, the flow of impressions, the emotions, the images. Uh, and that's, that's really, really scary, especially since, you know, we know that he has really strong ties with the Chinese. Uh, so the, the uh, you know acquisition of the of the technology that can monitor the population um, and do you know more than monitoring uh, how people move, but also how they feel and how they think, uh, that really really is scary. It's funny that you mentioned the Chinese. I was uh, uh, checking just the headlines this morning in Politica, the main newspaper uh, in Serbia, and um, one of the big headlines was uh, Xi Jinping is going to be making his second visit uh, to Serbia very, very soon. And it seems like Serbia is almost pivoting um, away from their traditional ally, Russia, as a counterbalance to the pressures from the European Union and the United States, uh, and making a real gambit with China. Um, China seems to be another major ally um, of Serbia. Um, I wouldn't say really as a way of resisting the West, but adding leverage to what the West might expect a small country like Serbia to just simply do uh, in terms of getting into the European Union. What can you, um, um, uh, you know, what can you look at, what can you assess as far as uh, Serbia's growing relationship uh, with China and its uh, sustained uh, partnership uh, with Russia? Well, uh, the, the problem with Russia is that historically Serbs have a very mixed feelings about it, you know, they, and they tend to be extreme from utter disappointment uh, in, in Russian impotence to, you know, this, this uh, uh, excited, uh, almost religious like attachment to uh, the idea that Russia is coming and that it's going to protect us. So we see in the Serbian history all this, uh, uh, you know, extremes of, of emotions and, and opinions about Russia. Uh, so what we see now is the you know a new power on the horizon that's not the West, of uh, you know that we we are afraid of, and it's not the Russia that you know today it is here and tomorrow it may not be here. What we see is a steady and thus uh, pretty assuring, incredible rise of China that uh, sort of makes the promise that it's not going to go away. 
So it's a it's a great uh, thing. It's it it it, it makes uh, people very hopeful that uh, that uh, China is, uh, by all accounts, uh, even by Western accounts, and people in Serbia know that, uh, is growing and growing, and it doesn't seem it's going to stop. Uh, China has the money. China has technology. Uh, from China, we get a lot of funny videos of pandas, of those bridges made of glass. Uh, so the soft power of China is, is, is growing. Uh, you have a lot of people, young people, who go to China to teach English or, uh, you know, uh, take take over sports teams of, of people in of uh, kids in high schools and all that. And these people write back. They 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 write back home and they say it's great here. You know, we have a lot of money. It's interesting. It's different. Uh, but you know, we're not coming back anytime soon. You know, and uh, people who go to work in Russia, they're there. You know, working constructions, uh, maybe some uh, you know oil fields or whatever. And they're coming back. You know, a lot of most of them want to come back because they don't like it there. So on all fronts, China appears to be much sol more solid and, and a long-term uh, partner. Um, the, the only the only uh, um, you know sort of a problem is that China is not uh, militarily so strong that it can protect Serbia. So if things go south as they did before, uh, Serbia can discover that uh, the West is much closer and the West is much stronger. And 70% uh, of Serbian uh, exports go to go to European Union. So, not even talking about about military aspects, but we're talking about pure economic aspects. Serbia can be devastated if the European Union decides to do so. So, what I uh, expect is that Serbia is going to uh, work with China, uh, but closely monitoring uh, Western discord on China. We see that uh, France and uh, 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 Germany are not so keen on, on uh, uh, breaking ties with China or being more harsh toward China as the U.S. is. So I think uh, the, the, the Serbia uh, under Vucic is, uh, and I can and I can you know uh, understand this and and, and uh, sort of I'm not sure I would have done I would I would do it differently. Um, it's gonna it's gonna play uh, uh, along this this current policy of, of cooperating with China, profiting from it. Uh, and not crossing the line, uh, not not provoking the West, um, uh, and and extending that that cooperation uh, uh, to, to, to not not uh, lifting it to, to the higher level uh, than the EU uh, itself is is doing that. You know? So somewhere somewhere on there, because uh, we are we are very close to, to, to the NATO countries, and and I don't think even Vucic wants to wants to test that. So. Uh, no matter how much people say that you know Serbia is in bed with Russia and China, um, you know we are um, very close to, to the West. Uh, we cooperate with NATO a lot. Uh, you know, recently I heard that uh, for one exercise we, that our army does with the Russian army, we have five exercises with NATO. It's just that they don't get much coverage in the population. So, so Serbia is, is playing uh, you know, all sides. But uh, when when things uh, get rough, uh, Serbia is going to show uh, obedience and loyalty to the West because the alternative would be too expensive. Um, yeah, I wanted to get to Serbia's relationship with the European Union. Um, you, br you bring up an interesting um, subject about Serbia's tenuous relationship with NATO. You know, NATO is always going to be uh, remembered as the military force that led the bombardment in 1999 and was responsible for um, detaching Kosovo from Serbia. But yet at the same time, Serbia relies on NATO to keep the primary peace, the primary security within Kosovo, and um, is in, you know, it, it heavily supports um, the idea that uh, NATO troops still are the ones that provide security for key monasteries, um, specifically Visoke Dechani, uh, the Patriarchate of Pech, um, the monastery in Gračanica, and the Mogorodice uh, uh, Leviška in uh, Prizren. Um, and at the same time, you, have, you, you, you bring up this idea of this, um, this, this, this I don't know, paradoxical relationship between the West. Serbia likes to um, bank on its... Um, advantages for not yet being a European Union member and feels that it has the flexibility to, um, you know, reach out to other countries like Russia, Turkey, China, um, India, among others. But clearly, Serbia does have an end goal, and that is membership within the European Union. Um, 
although when that is, remains just sort of indefinitely postponed, almost to the point of just this rolling, you know, deadline that the EU doesn't really seem to be interested in as well. What do you think um, explains this indefinite delay? Um, the re you know, the, the EU fatigue in reaching out to Serbia, Serbia's apparent inability at meeting the, you know, the criteria, the requirements, and whether or not, you, you know, do you honestly think that Serbia is being unfairly judged? I mean, aren't there countries in the EU today uh, that really should not have met the criteria when they joined, but were given membership anyway, uh, just for the sake of, you know, bringing them in? Um, you know, do you think that Serbia is being unfairly judged? Do you feel that Serbia truly has much work to accomplish? Is there something else that's, you know, holding it and the rest of the region back? Yeah, I, I see two questions there, you know, what Serbia wants and what the EU wants. Uh, and uh, Serbia is not a unitary actor and so is not, so is not the EU. Um, people in Serbia um, lost some sort of uh, excitement about becoming a, a, a member of the EU. Um, most of the people still would like to do that, would like to, to join, though not to pay the price of recognizing Kosovo as an independent state. Uh, the thing is that playing by EU rules, EU norms, EU practices, means abandoning the corrupt slash criminal practices that uh, Serbian government is now involved in. So this means losing all the leverages, all the, all the sources of, of their power. So what Serbian government cannot do are two things. It cannot get Serbia to the EU, and it cannot, must not say that it does not want to get Serbia into the EU. Why? Because declaring that uh, the goal of the government is not the EU membership would immediately put the EU into position of first acknowledging that the EU attractive power didn't work. There is a country completely surrounded by EU member states, and it's a poor country who simply does not want to be a member of the EU. So either there's something fishy about EU or there's something bad about that, that country. So of course, EU would then uh, have to necessarily prove that countries that do not want to be part of the EU that are in Europe are actually not going to do well without uh, a, a membership in the EU or at least accession process to the EU. So EU's interest then would be to do anything to prove that Serbia is not able to perform well to satisfy the needs of its population. So then we will we will see not just uh, you know loss of all the all the grants all the funds uh, that uh, EU grants to Serbia, but also maybe and I will not be surprised uh, intentional undermining of, of Serbian uh, economy. Um, uh, by the by the EU because it's 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 it reflects very bad on EU's image to have a country that is poor in the in Europe and just simply does not want to be a member of the of the EU. So what we have on the part of Serbian government is the optimal so to say equilibrium. Uh, we must never get into the EU, and we, we must never say that we don't want to get to the EU. On the part of the EU, the situation is sort of you know mirroring that. Uh, the, the citizens of the EU do not feel very nice about welcoming problematic states that they perceive are wild southeast. And I, you know, like one time I called it the, the you know, the middle middle southeast of Europe. You know, like the, the <laughs> like Middle East. You know, so so they don't want to uh, uh, lose voters by working hard and. Uh, you know, uh, bringing these countries uh, closer to the EU and granting them full membership, but they cannot say that. You know, so so what what is going on is that they're talking about standards, they're talking about criteria, they're talking about clusters, they're talking about the rule of law, this and that, just in order to avoid uh, declaring that yet yeah, they will get these countries into the EU or no that they will not get them into the EU because either would would reflect bad on EU's. Uh, uh, one would reflect bad on EU's image, and the other would reflect bad on the standing of these of these politicians. So this is a perfect equilibrium for both the leaders of the EU to pretend that they want to get these countries into the EU, and for the leadership uh, of of Serbia that they really want to get uh, to get to the EU. So what we see is, uh, as one one political scientist would say, organized hypocrisy. Well, I mean that says one thing about the countries that are not in the EU like Bosnia, Macedonia, Albania, Montenegro, and Serbia. But it, 
sort of raises another thing, is that if there's already this sense of stigma about bringing more countries from Southeastern Europe, the Balkans, um, you know, South Middle Eastern Europe into the fold, what does that say about Bulgaria, Romania, or Croatia, which are in the EU? But Croatia is, is, is doing, you know, relatively well. Uh, Romania is doing much better than before. Uh, Bulgaria has a really bad record, but uh, we have larger strategic considerations there. Uh, there is a pretty strong uh, pro-Russian sentiment in, in Bulgaria, and Bulgaria sits a very sensitive uh, uh, geopolitical location. So uh, one reason why Romania and Bulgaria were quickly uh, uh, admitted to the EU was was the, the, the fear of, of the Russian return, the Russian meddling uh, in the uh, among the pro-Russians, pr primarily in Bulgaria. Uh, so, so I think that was a larger strategic consideration. By getting the the the, the, the rest of the Western Balkans into the EU, uh, EU would get uh, EU leaders, uh, politicians who would decide to do that, they would get a very bad backlash from the voters. And what uh, um, what would also happen would would, would be that they would get some sort of a Trojan horse within the EU because uh, getting these countries into the EU means getting their ethnic frictions and unsolved uh, uh, border issues and also sovereignty issues um, into the EU as well. And EU does not have, or at least did not show, uh, military capacity to keep uh, to keep these uh, actors uh, peaceful. I mean, to, to, to police the, the region without NATO. And what French and the German don't want is that they import some sort of uh, ethnic, you know, ticking time bomb, and then they would have to rely on, on the U.S. Uh, to step into what would be officially European territory and uh, and police it. So we have uh, some sort of, uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid to say, uh, optimal optimal equilibrium, so to say. We are stuck uh, in this in this situation, and uh, this is what we see with the EU's initiative of the so-called small Schengen, small Schengen area that would get uh, countries in the region that are not members of the EU, like uh, North Macedonia, Albania, uh, Serbia, of course, Kosovo with a uh, star, uh, and, and Bosnia, and Montenegro into some sort of a zone of, uh, you know, bigger trade, freer trade, uh, less, you know, uh, red tape, uh, in, as some sort of an exchange uh, for full uh, full EU membership, so uh, that that is uh, you know the second best uh, best option for for the EU. It's just that it does not preclude uh, the, the US or the Chinese uh, from from meddling there. So I think I think the region is going to be like this uh, for many more years to come. Oh, I want to stick to the EU before we uh, get to the uh, the subject of Kosovo, but. Um, no, I had mentioned within the, one of the standalone lectures about the region and the European Union is that you know, Serbia is looking, I think, really at two countries uh, that have been uh, negatively affected by EU membership for two different reasons. The first one is Greece with the just catastrophic um, um, economic crisis that had hit the country um, and, um, you know, the austerity measures that all but gutted the country's sovereignty. And here we're talking about a country that is not a newcomer to the European Union. We're talking about a country that has, you know, higher GDP than anyone else in the region. And yet, look at what happened to Greece. And then for another reason, and this is a bit more unofficial, but Croatia, which is experiencing a significant population decline, um, not just in terms of declining birth rates, but the idea that for a country like Croatia, one of the best things that happened to it for most of its youth, is that the European Union, and you, you, you touched upon it, it's the Schengen idea. It's the idea that you can travel within the European Union without any kind of uh, visa or paperwork, and that's a green light for anybody 30 and younger to pack up and go to Germany, Austria, Italy, France, Denmark, Ireland. wherever. Ireland. Ireland as well? Yeah, people from Croatia massively go to Ireland. So, you know, I've been to Croatia a number of times, and while this doesn't, you know, qualify me as being an expert, I mean, I can tell you that outside of Zagreb and a few of the, you know, resort uh, towns on in the Dalmatian coast, there are vast areas of the country of Croatia that are just deserted 
Um, you know, so for instance, you know, the, uh, the, this, the, 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 the town, city, whatever you want to call it, of Karlovats almost seems deserted. That entire region just seems to have been um, just hit initially with the wars of secession in the 90s, all of, you know, everything from Karlovats to Vukovar, and it never really seemed to have recovered. There really doesn't seem to be any investment within the country um, by either the EU or by the Croatian government. And it just seems like these areas are going to, uh, you know, quickly depopulate into just small little, um, you know, their farms or retirement communities. Is this something that, you know, Serbia also fears is that, you know, as soon as it joins, it's basically going to be Belgrade, Novi Sad, and the rest you're going to just hear this in giant... <laughs> you know, sucking noise uh, from central, you know, from, 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 from middle Europa, uh, you know, out uh, from, the, uh, from the Balkans. Yeah, I mean, a lot of Serbs go to Croatia in the, in the summer season to work there in the hotels and the restaurants and cafes and the, in the hospitality industry. So uh, they, they speak the language, they know the region, the, 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 the Croats know them. So if you don't, uh, you know, shoot at each other, they can cooperate uh, quite well because they really understand each other. So that, that, that's already happening. We, we see it already happening. Uh, but people are also leaving Serbia. I mean, I'm here just I left toward the east, you know, not toward the west. But many, many people are, are leaving already. And, uh, you know, later on, they, they sort out the paperwork uh, in, the, in these European countries. So what we see is not just that Croatia is uh, having problems with the population. Serbia is also having problems with that. We already see... Uh, Serbs moving to Croatia to work, but also some Albanians moving to Serbia to work. So in the construction sites in Belgrade and some some other cities, but predominantly Belgrade, we have workers from from Turkey, but also from from Kosovo, and and uh, they're Albanians. They're not they're not uh, Serbs. So uh, we see that that the market, uh, the, the labor market, is is uh, moving people around, and uh, it's it's quite uh, interesting which uh, country will be courageous enough to. Um, to, to try to, to, to reverse the trends and actually uh, um, and actually try to get people from you know poor parts of the world uh, to come to 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 our region to, to Serbia for example and start life there because um, I, I wrote uh, some six years ago uh, in the height of the, of the migrant crisis uh, I wrote an article for, for Politica which is I, were, I was very proud of though I got a lot of hate mail. Uh, because of that, and I and I titled the the, the, the article "Why Serbia Needs R R Arab Refugees," and and I claimed that, that Serbia could do uh, in many dimensions quite well if it would open up for at least 15,000 uh, uh, places for people to, to come from all over the world, from the countries which are poorer than Serbia. And this is not just a, a you know dream. Uh, I have friends uh, who are who came from South America. Uh, friends who came from South America, uh, married uh, Serbs, and stayed in, in Belgrade, actually. And they work online. They, they send money back home to Venezuela, to some other countries, um, and they like it. They, they have no need to, to go to Germany or to, to go to France or wherever. So I think, um, I think that, that a country that would try to you know, pretend to be a Western country for, for immigrants from less fortunate countries in the, in the global South could actually re reverse the trends, uh, but of course I, I, I have no no high hope that uh, you know Vucic would do that. But um, it's not too far. I mean, we already have uh, a situation where the uh, Serbian opposition accused him of uh, when he actually said that uh, Serbia will need one million immigrants to supply its labor market, uh, and then the opposition jumped at that and said, oh, he wants to repopulate Serbia to get the Serbs out and. Uh, make Serbia a parking lot for, you know, uh, uh, African and Middle Eastern refugees. And then, of course, he backtracked and he, he uh, did not mention that again. Um, there was a controversial case of the agreement with the Austrian government, between Serbia and Austrian government, uh, on uh, um, uh, getting the migrants back from Austria to Serbia. Uh, and we were talking about, like, big numbers here. Of course, nothing happened. Uh, after that was uh, broken in the in the news, so of course gov government, uh, you know, deny that. But but we see that we need people, and we see that Serbs are not making enough babies. So put two and two together, we need to start uh, we need to start uh, getting migrants uh, to Serbia. Mm -hmm. We just we just don't know how to do it because we're not used to that. Well, I mean, you know. Uh... 
most countries in Europe uh, aren't so one that accepts migrants. They are countries that uh, throughout history have sort of produced, um, you know, emigrants to other countries. Yeah, but but I think that's that's a, that's a game changer, and that uh, the, the countries in, in Southeast and Eastern Europe just realize that um, that they have a chance to to get out of this trap. Because you see what's happening in Hungary. Uh, Orban is giving a lot of money to to women who have more than two kids. So what happens is that they do, well, you know, they do have kids, but they get out of the labor force. So again, you have this, you know, lag uh, uh, in, in 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 action. So. Um, I think there is a there is a there is a much deeper problem than than you know surface ethnic friction, and we need. Uh, I mean, I'm dreaming of more courageous leaders uh, that would see that and that uh, that would act on that. But I'm not that hopeful. Let's talk about another issue, one that seems to uh, never disappear from the front pages of Serbian media, and that, of course, is its wayward southern province of Kosovo. Um, we are now almost, almost another decade from the so-called Brussels Agreement, which was the closest uh, that uh, political leaders in Belgrade and Pristina came to creating some kind of um, consociational power-sharing arrangement. And yet, uh, successive governments in Kosovo have refused to implement the main element of that agreement, uh, the Municipality Association of Serbian Municipalities, is what it's formally called. Um, and Serbia has not been as active as it has been in the past in trying to uh, block Kosovo's entry into international organizations, but it seems that Kosovo has just uh, itself just hit a wall. Like, it seems to have um, gotten all the recognitions that it probably would get, um, and those countries that uh, have said that they are not going to recognize or they have no need to um, are not going to change their minds. Um, about a week or two ago, uh, the prime minister of Greece uh, paid a visit uh, to Kosovo, and uh, there was a few rumors that Greece was ready to recognize, but he was very careful in saying, no, this is not a formal recognition, but more so, and this is an interesting subject, it was sort of an upgrade of what was already a somewhat of a liaison office into some kind of economic cooperative or some kind of economic ministry, very similar to the ways in which countries that don't recognize Taiwan do business with Taiwan. And it led me mm -hmm. to believe that this might be a way forward um, as far as uh, the territory of Kosovo is concerned without having to worry about status. But yet at the same time, um, it still seems to be the assumption that before Serbia gets into the European Union, and this might actually just be something that is put up there just to cover for what you had mentioned beforehand about how the EU doesn't want and Serbia doesn't want, so Kosovo no one can agree on, but Serbia needs to figure out what it wants to do with, uh, with Kosovo. Um, where do you see this going? Um, I know you and I worked before on this, and I've already put my name to saying it's an indefinite frozen conflict. Um, I don't see any real change unless there is a major cataclysmic event, you know, in the geopolitical arena. But for the time being, I see Kosovo just being um, in limbo. Um, but obviously, there needs to be some kind of you know, pragmatic solution to a problem that you want to talk about a depopulating area. I mean, just uh, people in Kosovo are leaving uh, left and right. Um, so, you know, some of the, um, you know, the, the dark humor about this is that if nothing changes in about a decade, the only people that will remain in Kosovo are monks and, uh, and, and organized criminal uh, heads. <laughs> you know? So, but what, what, where, where do you see, what, where do you see Kosovo, Serbia from your point of view? Well, the, the main thing is that it's very hard to press Serbia to get Kosovo into the, into the UN. So uh, how do we know a country is independent? I mean, um, it's already established somehow that being a member of the UN means that you are equal to all other independent countries. So there is a, um, there is a, a measure that cannot be, um, you know, the, there, there can be no constructive ambiguity about that. No, either you are a member of the UN or you're not. 
that's that's the thing. You can be an observer, but you're still not a member. So that that's the thing. So we are locked into a zero sum game. Now the question is, can uh, someone make Serbia uh, raise hand and and vote or abstain or whatever uh, from from you know uh, in regard to Kosovo's member membership of the of the UN? And and no Serbian government can do that without risking the backlash, serious backlash uh, from the population. This is something that that Vucic cannot afford to do. You know, he can do many things, but uh, to vote for, uh, to allow without any resistance for Kosovo to become a member of the UN, uh, it's, it's quite, quite unlikely that, that um, he, could, he could get away with that. So what remains is that um, um, you, you, you cannot put pressure on Serbia because you cannot bomb it again. Uh, I mean, that would really be a very, very uh, unlikely scenario. So if you cannot bomb it, then what can you do? You, know, you, can, you can declare it a threat to regional stability and put it under international sanctions. That may have worked in the 1990s, but now it's you know, uh, 2021 and uh, China is much closer and Russia is much closer. And uh, we don't know if the countries around Serbia would uh, welcome such a heavy economic hit because a lot of people, a lot of goods uh, travel to uh, transit through Serbia uh, from all corners of, of, of Europe and, 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 uh, and Turkey. Uh, so a lot of people would suffer because of that. And, and I'm not sure that that would work. So besides, you know, putting Serbia under such a tremendous pressure would be like uh, uh, declaring that EU lost its, its persuasive power. It, it lost its, its attractive power to, to transform the region. So that's not an option. So if you cannot bomb Serbs, if you cannot put them under sanctions, really why would they do that so what kind of carrots can you offer to them so you can offer a membership into the eu but serbs can already take the passport and go to eu to work you know work for three months come back or go back you know things like that and people people manage that way a lot of people work online there's no need to, to physically move um so so what else you know people are not ready most people are not ready to give up on Kosovo because it's such a symbolic and, and emotional issue and on the other hand, uh, you, you can get by, you know, life is not as bad as in the 1990s. So really no, no incentive and no threat uh, to Serbia to make it recognize Kosovo. On the other hand, uh, furthermore, let us say, Serbian government uh, under Vucic, let's not forget, it's a criminal enterprise. If they recognize Kosovo, that means that it's over. So no, no reason now not to get into the EU, uh, which means then uh, EU will be more assertive and more uh, direct in uh, questioning the, the democratic policies, democratic practices in Serbia, rule of law, uh, than, than, than it has been so far. So there's much to lose by sorting out the Kosovo, Kosovo issue uh, and not much to gain uh, by doing this. So what Serbian government is doing is uh, the, the optimal direction, uh, blaming the Kosovo government for the stall in the negotiations because Serbian government respected most of uh, its commitments made in the Brussels agreement, while the Kosovo government did not uh, fulfill the, the um, obligation to establish the association of Serbian municipalities. And they cannot do that because uh, what they did in the past couple of years was to declare the establishment of such an association as a, a, a vital threat to, 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 to Kosovo because they perceive it as some sort of a uh, of, um, I mean, everybody's using this parallel with the Republic of Srpska in, in Bosnia, something, so, so an entity that can block, block decision-making, which is not quite true, but if people believe it, then it's, it's, uh, it's uh, politically effective, it's politically true, so then it, it affects our reality. So what we have here is two very weak societies, two very poor countries, I mean, country, and, uh, and the one of the country uh, who are, are dying out, who are um, depopulating, whose economic activity is not healthy. Uh, they don't produce much, but Serbia has um, more resources and can, can outlast, can outlast the, 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 the Kosovo, so to say. So if nothing changes, uh, Kosovo leaders can be pressured to declare unification with Albania and that would bring a major, major problem to NATO because Albania is a NATO member. Uh, it can bring major problem to EU because we, we see a uh, change of borders, which was not supposed to happen. 
at least not uh, in that way. Um, so, so a lot of, lot of uh, uh, like a chain reaction that uh, really puts Serbia out of the spotlight and, and, and makes uh, this Albanian, uh, greater Albanian nationalism uh, as, as a villain, which then retroactively uh, can uh, 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 shed a different light on the whole conflict from the 1990s. So that the question is not about uh, human rights anymore, it's about nationalism. So, so it can it can open a big can of can of worms, uh, but in the foreseeable future, I don't see anything that can that can change the, the status quo. And we see that uh, uh, Albanian society in Kosovo is weaker, and it's a question how uh, it's a big question how it can perform uh, uh, in the next in the next five, 10, 15 years, uh, especially if it happens so, which is not very likely uh, so far to get a visa liberalization with the EU, which would then open floods, and, and we will see. A rapid depopulation of, of, of Kosovo uh, Albanians living. Um, some people can remember also that the great migrant crisis from the, from the Middle East, the, the wave of Syrian refugees that was going through the Balkan route, was actually, was actually predated by one year by a massive, massive and sudden, unexpected flow of Albanian refugees who just, for some reason, overnight it seemed like. Uh, they they got onto buses because someone put out the news that Germany is wait, waiting them with open arms, and they went through Serbia in, in incredible numbers to to reach Germany. And and uh, later on, some research showed that the the paths and the connections established uh, in 2014 actually served well in 2015 for the for the Syrian refugees. So we see a very very unstable society, unstable uh, um, situation in Kosovo. Uh, and and uh, we don't see we don't see any any sort of a, of a quick fix. So I would say status quo until something bad happens. Um, let's talk very briefly um, about the recent um, political developments in Montenegro. Um, I had also mentioned in this week's lecture series that uh, counter to uh, prevailing assumptions that Alexander Lukashenko is Europe's longest running dictator. Um, the real one, uh, the one that every, the, the one that everyone, of course, um, those those that know know, is uh, Milo Djukanovic, the longtime power broker of uh, Montenegro, who uh, recently um, experienced him and his party experienced a number of electoral setbacks. Um, it doesn't mean that um, he is out of politics forever, but it does mean that his own political party no longer um, controls the country. And it seems to now be that uh, Montenegro is um, under the leadership of a coalition of really anti Zukanovic forces, some of which are uh, much more pro-Serbian, uh, more, more likely to mend fences uh, and repair ties with Belgrade. Um, do you see this as something similar to the um, the social events of Serbia in 2000. I don't want to equate Djukanovic with Milosevic, but we are really talking about longtime party autocrats that you know turned the state into really a, a private enterprise for them, their family, and their and, and their um, immediate inner circle. Um, so, what can you say about um, you know the recent turn of events in um, in, in Montenegro? So. Uh... I think Montenegro is, is best defined as now uh, a concentration of three groups. So one group is uh, the, the, the people around Milo Djukanovic and this whole uh, Montenegrin ethno-nationalistic, even cleric, clerical nationalistic movement that wants to define new Montenegrin nation in sort of ethnic terms. So what, how they do it is in opposition to whatever is Serbian because um, Serbian Montenegrin history is really one of um, overlap rather than than uh, a merger, so to say. So it is a it is a one of the I, I would say most interesting cases of of, of, of uh, modern nationalism, postmodern nationalism, uh, where uh, until recently there was really no uh, um, question that that Montenegrins are just. Uh, one part of the Serbian nation, while now in, in Djukanovic and his uh, team's uh, um, reinterpretation, Montenegrins are ethnically different than Serbs. On the other hand, we have a smaller group uh, with two uh, most more prominent leaders um, who act 
as Montenegro is a, 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 a country of civic nationalism. So the Montenegro nationalism is a civic sign. You know, we don't care if your ethnicity is Albanian or Serb or whatever, it's past history, who cares? We look at the citizenship and whoever is a citizen of Montenegro is a Montenegrin and we respect everyone. And they have more uh, of, a, of an antagonistic approach to um, this ethnic, ethno-nationalism, whether it is Montenegrin or Serbian, but they focus mostly on EU integrations, democracy, uh, ethnic tolerance, and that, that, uh, that kind of religious tolerance, that kind of a more progressive, modern, modern outlook. So what they are opposed to is uh, Djukanovic's 30-year rule that resulted in vast-scale corruption and organized criminal activity. But they are also not uh, happy with the ethno-nationalism, whether it's Serbian or Montenegrin. And the third pole of Montenegrin society is uh, actually the, the Serb nationalist pole. So the, the, the ethnic, ethnic, so to say, uh, uh, Serbs in Montenegro who uh, hate that Montenegro is an independent country, who, would, who consider Montenegro just one of the Serbian lands, and who hate Djukanovic not just because he's a corrupt and, and criminal, uh, um, in his in his political uh, um, uh, activities, but also that he creates Montenegro nation as separate to Serbia nation. So what we had last year was um, Djukanovic's um, uh, law that that was in the making that would have stripped Serbian Orthodox Church in Montenegro of large uh, uh, real estate, and this ticked off this uh, Montenegrin civic kind of nationalist. Uh, poll uh, as something that is uh, illegal, as something that is deeply, <clears throat> deeply <clears throat> anti-modern. And that's why they, they uh, saw the opportunity to unite with the Serbs in Montenegro against the economy. So <clears throat> at the same time, the Serbs in Montenegro saw the opportunity to work with this kind of moderate Montenegrins and, and uh, uh, get the economy down. So what we had was the mobilization for two different reasons. Uh, by Serbs and by these, these moderate, I would call them moderate Montenegrins, uh, against Djukanovic. And they won by, ju by just one member of parliament. So they had 41 against 40 uh, majority in parliament. And this was promising that it would lead to cleaning up of the country, establishing rule of law and prosecuting uh, many members of Djukanovic's 30-year-long uh, regime uh, that is uh, uh, really, really steeped into, into organized crime and corruption. However, the identity issues resurfaced by a very cunning uh, uh, strategy of, of Djukanovic. Namely, one of the ministers in the new government stated that Srebrenica is not genocide. Uh, it could not be considered genocide. And this pushed off the table all the talks about uh, corruption, all the talks about crime, and it had... Uh, and it pushed the new uh, uh, winning coalition of the Serbs and moderate Montenegrins to take positions on that. Of course, Serbs deny that, that Srebrenica was genocide, while uh, Montenegrin, the, the so-called moderate Montenegrins, I like to call them, uh, they accept that Srebrenica was genocide. So at that moment, these uh, moderate Montenegrins and Milo Djukanovic's ethnic, I would say anti-Serb Montenegrins, made a coalition, made a, made a de facto coalition and ousted uh, the minister who said that, which of course led to the enormous storm of charges from Belgrade and from Serbs of Montenegro that the anti djukanovic front was betrayed. Well, actually, these people had no other choice but to declare that they do agree that Srebrenica was genocide because that way they buy the ticket to be admitted to, to uh, the West, to the European Union, and the US as, as stable allies. So what we see here is actually three poles that have that that uh, 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 constitute two majorities. One majority, uh, Serb and moderate Montenegrin, is against Milo Djukanovic and his corruption for different reasons, and the other majority is moderate Montenegrins and Milo Djukanovic's ethnic Montenegrins who are against Serbs when it comes to identity questions such as whether Srebrenica is genocide or not. So what we see here is uh, sliding toward new elections. The parliament is very unstable. We don't know who is majority. It depends on which question you ask. If you ask a question about corruption, then you have 
Serbs and, and moderate Montenegrins on one side. If you ask, ask a question about you know, the, the Srebrenica genocide, then you have uh, Milo Djukanovic, ethnic Montenegrins and moderate Montenegrins on one side. So new elections, I don't believe, will bring any, any, any new difference. The question now is, who will sacrifice what? Are Serbs in, in Montenegro going to sacrifice this identity uh, question and accept uh, that they will have to make a coalition with people who claim Srebrenica was genocide, or they will not accept it? If they don't accept it, we see Milo Djukanovic back in, in power. This is actually a nice segue into um, the final set of questions here, and that is, you know, let's take a look maybe in the next five years, the next 10 years into the region. Um, you know, unfortunately, the Balkans kind of fall between, really, um, the relative success of Central Europe and um, the entrenched stagnation of the former Soviet Union. The Balkans are kind of like in between. There is progress, but it's very... Um, um, it, it's, it's very steady, almost to the point of, almost, uh, of being stalled at times. Um, we see really the, the fall of a stabilocrat in Montenegro and the rise of one in Serbia. We see um, just continued um, political, um, what's the word here, political... Um, hamstringing in Albania, um, in Macedonia, in Bosnia. We haven't even gotten to Bosnia, but Bosnia is just a, you know, a mess here. Um, what would you feel would be necessary to just untangle the, you know, the proverbial Gordian knot of all of these internal socio-political, uh, you know, socio-cultural problems plaguing these countries and territories? Um, over the next five, ten years. Yeah, I think I think we must go around the the, the fortresses of uh, of um, unsolvable problems. I mean, if you cannot use violence uh, or some sort of rapid uh, and strong economic sanctions to, to to you know cut the the Gordian knot, then you must go around it. Just like in the military strategy, you don't need to uh, seize uh, a city. You just lay a siege on it and move forward and, and wait for that uh, city to become uh, so, so drained that it, it is going to give up. So uh, nobody's going to solve Bosnia and nobody's going to solve Kosovo issue uh, anytime soon. So let's see what we can do around it. You know? And this is what, precisely what I think European Union is trying to do with this uh, small Schengen uh, project, this, this regional area of uh, enhanced cooperation. Uh, of, of uh, you know, easier movement of, of goods and the capital and the people. And I think that's the, that's the right way to go. All right. So closing statements, uh, Dr. Murdal. Um, any final thoughts, assessments about uh, the region? Uh, anything that you would like, um, you know, our students to, uh, you know, walk away from uh, with this conversation? Yeah. One, one thing I did not mention that is uh, sort of, is my, my um, passion, so not say fixation, is the uh, importance of something that sounds so technical and dry, but actually it's not. And uh, I believe it is, it is very important to mention, and that's uh, the role of the electoral system uh, that, that uh, it played in the rise of this latest wave of, of autocracy. Uh, I believe that uh, not many people know, especially in the West, that what we have in, in Serbia and Montenegro, by the way, um, is an uh, electoral system that is country as one electoral district, which means that uh, people who vote actually have no idea who is going to be in the parliament. And the, the, the current uh, uh, Serbian parliament hosts um, people of a very, very uh, uh, colorful, so to say, characters. Uh, we have kids who are 23 years old uh, and we have people who are barely illiterate, I would say, uh, who who are just loyal party members and who are rewarded uh, to be members of parliament uh, in order to raise hand when it's asked from them. So the parliament is stacked by party uh, soldiers and they do as they're told. So this leads to a complete lack of any sort of oversight by the parliament. And in Serbia, it's been accumulating for many, many years now. Even when we had uh, the so-called pro-Western, pro-democratic 
uh, forces in power, the executive branch was able to do whatever it wanted because it had always uh, a, a firm control over the parliamentary majority. Uh, um, especially now when we have one dominant party, that's, that's most obvious. So what I've been advocating and what gave me some sort of a little prominence in the media uh, recently, especially in the, in, of course, in the, in the independent and, and the opposition oriented media uh, is, the, is the idea and the need to reverse the trend and, and actually um, break that party control over the parliament and go back to voting for members of parliament by their name in the in the majoritarian electoral system. Now I'm I'm aware that in the U.S. there's a lot of unhappiness with the first as the post, and uh, I understand that. But uh, here uh, the opposite has been a very very uh, a, a bad for the state of democracy, and uh, it shows a lot of uh, a negative uh, effects that I think people who are into reforming U.S. electoral system uh, should take a look into. Uh, and I would particularly point out the importance of the size of the electoral district. So many people say, you know, uh, oh, you know, if you go to 200, Serbian parliament has 250 members of parliament. So we have 250 uh, electoral districts, uh, all electing one member of parliament. Uh, that's the solution. Uh, the, the most important thing is that the size of the district uh, is, is, in that case, about 25 to 30,000 voters which changes the dynamics completely because you don't need a lot of money to, to run for office. You don't need uh, support of uh, big national media to run for office. So uh, that, is a, that is a consideration that uh, takes a lot of my time in the recent couple of years. Uh, I'm focusing on that. And I think um, putting more uh, of a name to, to, to the ballot, a name of a person, not, not the name of the party, because on our ballots, we don't have names of, of uh, candidates. We just have the, the, the party names. Uh, I think that would help tremendously uh, the situation in Bosnia and the situation in Montenegro and the situation in, in Serbia, uh, definitely. And I would, I would dare to claim in other countries in the region, because people need to uh, learn democracy through learning accountability. And you cannot learn accountability uh, if you don't hold persons by their name and surname uh, accountable for what they do, because otherwise they just move from one party to another. Uh, and currently in this, this ruling party in Serbia, we have scores of, of cadre of, of uh, former pro-Western, pro-democratic, um, Democratic Party or Democratic Party of Serbia or whatever, who just migrated like, like um, locusts, uh, I would say, uh, from one party to another to, to eat on the, on the government funds. So I, I would like, uh, if, if your students survived so far, uh, to, to get this uh, as, as uh, something that I think is not the dry or technical topic, it's essential for preserving democracy. So, you know, I would dare to say that in the US, I don't think that more proportional representation would be necessarily good, but that uh, smaller, smaller electoral districts uh, would, would bring about a, a, a qualitative difference uh, to um, to the U.S. politics. So that 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 much for me. Um, you know, what better way of bringing it back to good old general theories of comparative politics after uh, an hour of uh, in-depth discussion of the uh, region? Um, so I want to thank you, Mladen, for giving us your time and uh, your expertise. Um, students, I think, will find uh, a lot of this to be uh, incredibly insightful. Um, so uh, for mm -hmm. all of you enrolled, um, there will be a special discussion thread uh, that will be connected to uh, this uh, discussion, this interview. Um, Laden will also have access to that, so you can ask him questions directly, uh, and he'll be more than happy to um, answer you back. All of that goes uh, towards participation. And uh, for all of you passive uh, watchers and listeners on YouTube,
YouTube. Uh, the comment sections below are open for your criticism, your praise, uh, whatever it is that you would like, and uh, both of us will be more than happy uh, to answer back if you have um, any uh, additional questions or inquiries to that. Um, Laden, thank you once again uh, for your time. Thank and you, um, next week, everyone, we are beginning our section on Russia and near abroad, where our guest speaker will be Dr. Nikolai Petro, and followed up with our last uh, regional section on Central Asia. So stay tuned because uh, we're only at the halfway mark here, folks, and I really hope that you're finding this material interesting. Right? Mladen, thank you once again for your time, and uh, we'll see you all online.